Do you remember the Libra coin that Facebook started working on back in 2017? It was supposed to be a stable coin backed by multiple fiat currencies, but the coin faced a huge resistance from governments and financial regulators, and they claimed that it threatens the stability of traditional financial systems and fiat currencies like the US dollar, and could be used in money laundering. Other than that, the Libra blockchain was planned to be a centralized blockchain at the beginning. So, in an attempt to launch and get the approval of regulators, it was rebranded as the DM blockchain in 2020, and the DM coin was then planned to be backed only by the US dollar. But still, that didn't work, and the project was shut down in January 2022. What's interesting here is that after the shutdown, some of the developers that worked on the DM project went and launched their own crypto projects using some of the technology they worked on when they were working on the DM blockchain. Until now, we have two projects founded by ex-Meta engineers, which are Aptos and Sui. Welcome to Cryptobi, where we explain cryptocurrencies and DeFi topics in the most simple and beginner-friendly way. In this video, you will know what is Aptos and how its technology actually works, and finally, we will talk about the tokenomics of the APT coin. So, what is Aptos? Aptos is a layer 1 blockchain that supports smart contracts, which simply means that tokens and applications can be built on top of it, just like Ethereum. Aptos was designed by two ex-Meta employees, which are Mohammed Sheikh and Avery Ching. When the engineers at Facebook were working on the DM blockchain we talked about earlier, they had access to near-infinite resources and a lot of time. So, the technology they developed has to be special, right? So, when the project was shut off, Mo Shake and Avery Ching went and launched Aptos, and it gained the attention of many VCs. So, they raised a funding of more than $350 million over two rounds. The first round was led by Andreessen Horowitz, in which they raised $200 million. And the second round was led by FTX, and they raised $150 million. Shortly after that, Binance also went in and invested in Aptos, but the amount is not known till now. The weird thing here is that they received all this funding without releasing the tokenomics or even the white paper of the project. So, what is the purpose or vision of Aptos? Well, they claim that Aptos was created as a fast and secure blockchain with low transactions fees to help bring Web3 adoption to the masses. The Aptos team claims that their blockchain can process up to 160,000 transactions per second. But an interesting thing here is that when the Aptos mainnet launched in October 2022, the blockchain was processing only four transactions per second on the launch day, which was concerning for many investors. But the Aptos team claimed that it was because there was no enough activity on the blockchain, as it is pretty new. As of the time of making this video, the Aptos blockchain has an average speed of around seven transactions per second, and in the last month, it reached a peak of 288 transactions per second. So, until now, the blockchain hasn't been really tested, and we can't say if it will be able to deliver these very fast performance numbers or not. Now, let's talk about how Aptos actually works and the technology that theoretically should enable it to process up to 160,000 transactions per second. So, there are three main things we need to explain for you to understand how Aptos works, which are transactions parallel execution, the Aptos BFT consensus algorithm, and the new move programming language. Don't be confused with any of their names, we'll explain all of them very simply. Let's start with the parallel execution of transactions. So, when you make a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, it gets sent to something called the memory pool, which is simply a group of unconfirmed transactions. All the transactions in this pool need to be executed and added to a block on the Ethereum blockchain. Executing a transaction here means processing it. For example, if you were sending 50 Tether tokens to a friend, then executing the transaction here means deducting 50 Tether tokens from your balance and increasing the balance of your friend by 50 Tether tokens. So what happens is that a validator or a computer on the Ethereum network gathers some transactions from this memory pool and executes them sequentially one at a time. Transactions that pay high gas fees are executed first and all the other transactions have to wait for their turn. As you can tell, this sequential execution mechanism can take a lot of time and force you to pay higher gas fees especially when there are a lot of transactions 
waiting to be executed and confirmed. So, now you may be thinking, why not the validator just execute multiple transactions at the same time? Well, that is known as parallel execution, and if we did that instead of executing one transaction at a time, the validator for example, will execute all four transactions at the same time, each CPU thread will execute a transaction. But the problem with this is that two transactions in one block may attempt to spend the balance of an account at the same time, which can lead to double spending. For example, let's say that Taylor has 500 Tether tokens, and he makes two transactions, one to send Jessica 500 tokens, and the other to send John another 500 Tether tokens. If the transactions are executed sequentially, then one transaction will go through and get executed, and then, Taylor's balance will be updated, and the other transaction will simply fail, as he won't have enough balance. But, if the transactions are executed in parallel, then, both transactions will read that Taylor has enough balance, and both of them may go through and get executed, leading to the double spending of the tokens. In Solana for example, they figured out a way to get around this by processing only the independent transactions in parallel. So, what does that mean? Well, independent transactions are transactions that don't read or modify the same accounts or data. For example, if John is sending 100 Tether tokens to Taylor and Jessica is sending 300 tokens to Jennifer, then the two transactions are independent as they don't need to read or modify the same accounts. But if Michael is sending you 200 Tether tokens, and then you send 100 tokens to Adam, then the two transactions are called dependent or overlapping transactions, as the second transaction depends on the result of the first transaction. Another example of dependent transactions is transactions interacting with the same liquidity pool on Uniswap or on any other decentralized exchange. So, Solana can process the first two independent transactions in parallel without any problems. But, the thing here is that, Solana requires any transaction to specify which accounts or data it will read from or modify before getting executed, so that the network can analyze the transactions to see which transactions are dependent, and then set up the independent transactions to be executed in parallel. This approach is not that very developer-friendly as it puts limitations and requires extra work from the developers of applications on Solana. So Aptos takes another approach in trying to execute transactions in parallel. They use a technology called Block SDM to execute transactions in parallel, without the developers having to state the data that the transactions will read or write to. So, to be able to do this, in Block SDM, there is a multi-version data structure, which is simply a memory that can store more than one version for the same data. A very simple example of this is that your account can have more than one version for its balance value. So, in one version, you may have 50 tokens, in another version, you may have 100 tokens, and in another one, you may have 80 tokens, and so on. You'll understand why we need this in a minute. But now what happens in Aptos is that transactions are ordered and executed optimistically in parallel, which simply means that we assume there is no dependent or overlapping transactions. So we try to execute them all in parallel at the same time, and then we verify later if there are any dependent transactions or not. For example, let's say that we have eight transactions in the block, and three of them are you sending tokens to other people, so they are dependent transactions. Let's say that they are transaction one, transaction two, and transaction three in the order. When the validator is executing transaction one, for example, it has to read the data of your account, so it reads your balance which equals 200 tokens in this example, and then deducts the transaction amount from your balance, which is 20 tokens, but the result of the transaction, which is your new balance in this case, is not stored on the blockchain immediately, it gets stored as a new version of your account data. At the same time of processing this transaction, transaction 2 is also processed. So it will read also the original version of the data, not the version created by the first transaction, as the two transactions are processed at the same time, so the data written by transaction 1 wasn't there. So it will read the original version of your balance, deduct the transaction amount, and then write your new balance as a new version of your account data. Transaction 3 is also processed at the same time, so it will also read the original version of your balance, and will be processed exactly like transaction 2, leaving a new version of your balance in the memory. Transaction 4 on the other hand is independent, so it will be executed without any problems at the same time, as it reads and writes to different data. Now we executed the first four transactions in parallel, so what happens now? Well, now the network has to verify if dependent transactions exist or not. 
So, to verify, we look again at the data that was read by each transaction to see if there is any new versions written or not. An important point here is that during verifying transaction 2 for example, we will only read the latest data written by the transaction that comes before it in the order, which is transaction 1. So, during verifying transaction 3, the network will read the data version written by transaction 2, as it is the latest data. If for example, transaction 4 was also dependent, and it wrote a new version, then, during verifying transaction 3, the network will still read the version written by transaction 2, as it comes before transaction 3 in the order. So, we have to read its results, before executing transaction 3. So, during the verification process, the network compares the latest data version available, with the data version that was read during processing the transaction. So, during verifying transaction 1, the network can see that the latest data available before transaction 1 is the original version, which is the same version that was read during processing transaction 1. So it will pass the verification without any problems. But during verifying transaction 2, the network will find out that the latest data version available before transaction 2 is the version written by transaction 1, which is different from the original data version that was read during processing transaction 2. So, transaction 2 will fail the verification, and it will need to be re-executed at a later time. The same will happen with transaction 3. The network will find that the latest data version available before transaction 3 is the one written by transaction 2, which is also different from the original version that was read during execution. So, it will also fail the verification and will be executed at a later time. As for transaction 4, it will pass the verification as it is independent and has nothing to do with these three transactions. A point you should know here is that verification also happens in parallel to reduce time. Now, you may be thinking that these are a lot of unnecessary steps and two of the four transactions failed. Well, you are right. That is why Block SDM tries to reduce the number of unnecessary executions and validations by marking the data that was modified by previous transactions. Don't be confused, it is really simple, remember when the verification of transaction 2 failed. Well, when that happens, the network will remember your account data and will mark the data version of transaction 2 as failed. So any transaction that tries to read this data in the future will be stopped before being executed until transaction 2 is successfully re-executed and the mark is removed. So in the next four transactions, the network will re-execute transaction 2 but will not try to re-execute transaction 3, as it will fail the verification anyways, because it tries to read the marked data location of transaction 2. After re-executing transaction 2, then, transaction 3 can be re-executed, and this is done to prevent unnecessary re-executions like what we said. So, that is generally how Block SDM works, which theoretically can allow Aptos to process up to 160,000 transactions per second. If you still didn't really understand this part, here is a very simple analogy. So think of Ethereum as a one-lane road. All the cars have to pass this road one by one, the cars in this analogy are the transactions. Aptos and Solana on the other hand are like four-lane expressways that can handle more traffic and can allow cars to pass faster obviously. But the difference here is that Solana assigns each car to the most suitable lane for it, to avoid conflicts with other cars, and once a lane is assigned, it can't be changed. But Aptos on the other hand doesn't assign cars to specific lanes, any car can pass through any lane, and if it doesn't work or it will cause conflicts, then the car is allowed to change the lane. So in this analogy, Solana tries to prevent conflicts at the first place, but Aptos assumes that there won't be any conflicts, and if they happen, then it deals with them. If you got the idea and have been enjoying the video so far, hit the like button, as a new channel, it really helps us. Now let's get to the consensus mechanism of Aptos. So, Aptos uses a consensus mechanism called Aptos BFT, which stands for Aptos Byzantine Fault Tolerance. It is a version of proof of stake. And the term Byzantine Fault Tolerance here simply means that the Aptos blockchain can still work and process transactions correctly even if up to one third of all validators are malicious and trying to attack the network. We have a full video about Byzantine Fault Tolerance if you want to learn more about it. But here, what happens is that validators need to stake or lock up a large amount of coins to be able to verify transactions on the network. For each new block of transactions, the network randomly chooses a validator to be the leader that processes the transactions, but the more coins the validator locks up, the higher the chances of getting chosen. Also, reputation affects the chances of getting selected in Aptos, 
So, validators that have been working correctly for a long time also have higher chances than the other validators. After a validator is chosen, it will gather some transactions, order them, and then execute them in parallel, like how we explained, and then send them to the other validators on the network, along with how the blockchain state will look like after executing these transactions. The other will check the transactions, their order, and then vote on the block, either accepting it or refusing it. The voting is done over two rounds to make sure that every validator receives the block and votes on it. Participating in voting here improves the reputation of a validator, which raises its chances of getting selected to process the next blocks. When a block is accepted by more than two-thirds of all validators on the network, it gets added permanently to the blockchain, and the leader gets rewarded with some APT coins. An important point to know here is that on Aptos, each validator needs to lock up 1 million APT coins, which are worth more than $13 million right now, which is a very, very large number. And currently there are around 104 validators on the Aptos network, and we don't really know who exactly is running these validators. Now, we can't talk about Aptos without talking about what can be considered the most important piece, which is the new Move programming language. Move is the programming language used to write the code of smart contracts and applications on Aptos, as well as SUI. Move was designed at first by the Facebook team for the Libra blockchain, and it is based on Rust, which is in another programming language that is used in Solana, Polkadot, and Nier. This means that developers on these blockchains won't need to start learning Move from scratch, as it has some similarities with Rust. But one of the main differences between Move and Solidity, which is the programming language used on Ethereum, is that tokens or NFTs are treated like physical assets. So they are stored as resources or objects in the user account. These resources can only exist in one place. So the token is either stored in your account or in my account. In Ethereum, on the other hand, tokens are treated as digital numbers. There is a contract for the token. And in that contract, your address is assigned a balance that changes when you make transactions. This is done in move to supposedly improve security and to protect against a type of attacks known as reentrancy attacks which allow hackers to drain tokens from a smart contract like what happened in the DAO hack in 2016 and the Crane Finance hack in 2021. Before we end the video, let's talk about the tokenomics of the APT coin. So it has three main uses on the Aptos blockchain. It is used to pay for transaction fees, it can be staked by the validators, and finally, it is used for governance, which means that it allows its holder to suggest and vote on changes to the Aptos blockchain but this is currently limited to validators, not token holders. So when the mainnet launched in 2022, 1 billion APT tokens were minted, and their distribution is as follows. 13.5% to the investors, 16.5% to the Aptos Foundation, 19% to core contributors, and 51% to the community, which will be distributed by the Aptos Foundation through grants and incentives. Only 160 million APT tokens are currently unlocked and circulating in the market, and the majority of these tokens comes from the 51% allocated to the community. As for the rest of the tokens, they will unlock in the future over specific periods, you will find a link in the description to these durations. An important point to know here is that these locked tokens are held and staked by the Aptos Foundation, including tokens allocated to the community, and any staking rewards they earn are not locked. Which means that the investors, the foundation, and the Aptos team can currently sell any staking rewards they earn from their lock tokens, which is concerning to many investors. Other than that, APT is an inflationary coin with an inflation rate of 7%, which means that the supply increases each year by 7%. This 7% comes from the staking rewards distributed to validators. The inflation rate reduces by 1.5% each year until it reaches 3.25% in 50 years and also the transaction fees are burned on Aptos. According to the Aptos team, by 2032, the total circulating supply of APT will be around 1 billion, 600 million tokens. At the end of this video, we hope you learned what you need to know about Aptos and how it works, and if you liked our video, hit the like button, let us know in the comments if you have any questions or video ideas, and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our new videos. Thanks for watching.